Hello again everyone, it's Mr. Most Days Off, and I'm back again today to talk to you about the new movie, War Dogs. A story of a friend scamming his way through life and bringing his other friend along for the ride and everything goes rosy as you can imagine. Uh, this movie is based on a true story and it stars Miles Teller and Jonah Hill. Uh, but before we get any farther, I of course didn't see this movie alone. I once again went with my good friend and your co-host with the most, Richie the Whiz Kid. How are you today, Rich? Good, good, good. So we got a Miles that scams people into doing things that he wants, although it was the other character, but I just wanted to throw say, that I say, you little... got that backwards, sir. <laughs> I just had to throw the Miles link in there. But <laughs> I'm doing great today. I'm going to throw it back to you over there. The man, the myth, the Mr. Me Seeks that can't help you. It is Miles. <laughs> I love that show so much. Um, yeah, Rick and dude, Morty, always. Rick and Morty is fantastic. Forever and ever, a hundred times. Show out. But yeah, so this was a pretty cool story. Uh, it's, again, supposedly based on a true story, which, well, it is based on a true story, but again, you never know how much of that is actually in the movie and how much of it is uh, amplified for, for making it a more interesting story. But this was pretty dope. Uh, about two 20-somethings that essentially get involved in the arms race uh, through semi-legal means. Uh, again, it had Jonah Hill, who, as pretty much always nowadays just impressed the hell out of me with his acting chops in this role. I, I, you, you brought it up last week. One of our favorite movies of all times, one of his earliest roles accepted, and he was good in that movie, but like going back and watching it, I would have never predicted that <laughs> Jonah Hill became the actor that Jonah Hill has become. He's really, really quite phenomenal. Um, he played a very, very annoying character in this movie. And if you just watch, if you watch our podcast and you hear me say that, you're like, oh, he's always annoying. But I actually mean yeah. that in the most respectful way I can. His character is supposed to be annoying. He's basically a metaphorical rat in this movie, and he was a almost he was amazing. As, he was really good. He's almost as much as a douche as the villain from the last film we reviewed. I think that undersells his performance in this movie. Like I genuinely like. You knew there's something shady about him, but you wanted to. You were happy to see him succeed. And that, that damn laugh that he does that you oh, hear in the previews, I, I can't every time make it, but it's so good. Every time, every time he it. does it, it makes you laugh. And I, I was a little shocked how much I actually enjoyed his character on this. Yeah, and again, it's just you know this uh, in a lot of ways this goes back and reminds me of Moneyball, but not in that he's at all the same character. I don't mean it like that. I just mean that it was a character that you would never have guessed Jonah Hill would play. And he fucking nails it. Like, he's just, he, he hits it perfectly. I, I think he did a great job. I don't know if I would use the word annoying as much as, like, douchey. Because, I mean, like, his character was obnoxious. He was, like, an obnoxious asshole. But, like. You're I, uncomfortable every time he was in around other people other than Miles Teller. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're absolutely. supposed to feel that way. Yeah, and spoiler absolutely. spoiler alert when you throw out the Moneyball name for later on in the, in the show segment there. Spoiler alert. Oh, I got you. I got you. <laughs> oh, that's a good choice. Um, We'll get to that. <laughs> So, something kind of interesting that I read on the IMDB, which we use a lot on this show, uh, the real-life Ephraim Diverali refused to meet with Jonah Hill, but Jonah Hill responded basically that he's come to find if somebody is really strongly opposed to him playing them, it's probably a good sign. And I'm not 100%, but was, was that a reference to Moneyball, the role that he played in that as well? Um, what do you do? You mean like he actually reached out to the person he was playing in Moneyball? Yeah, like I, I was wondering if maybe the person in Moneyball that he portrayed heard Jonah Hill was gonna play him and was like that fucking fatto. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want him playing me or some something like I, that. I, I was wondering. I know you read a lot of Entertainment Week, Weekly. I was wondering if you may have heard something that I hadn't there. On Moneyball, on that, on that regards, no, I didn't, but. The focus of that movie is more on Billy being uh, Brad Pitt's character and like Ron Washington and stuff like that. So in the actual players, I honestly am not familiar with uh, the assistant GMs in the sports world. I know a lot about sports, but not that much. Fair enough. No, I was thinking more so from the entertainment standpoint because just like, I gotcha. well, with uh, with Jonah Hill saying essentially that it's a good sign if somebody doesn't want him to play them. I, that that gives me the impression that he feels that. He's played other people's real life personas before they've been opposed to it, and he 
it went quite well with for him. So again, that would allude to, in my mind, Moneyball. But regardless of all that, the real life uh, Diverole did not want to meet Jonah Hill, so we don't really know what he was like in real life. But whatever this character he played is, it's great. And uh, apparently, he by choice put on a lot of weight for this movie because he, his weight has fluctuated a lot throughout. His yeah, time at this yeah, point. yeah. But, I, mean, I, he was I heard trim. that same thing. He was trim for uh, 21 and 22 Jump Street for the most part, and and a few other roles I'm blanking on. But he's, he's he goes very back slimmed and up. he went like fat and Moneyball, skinny and 21 Jump Street, 21 Jump Street, fat and Wolf of Wall Street, skinny and 22 Jump Street. Like it's unless they just filmed them all in order <laughs> at one at one time, which is highly unlikely. Yeah. Then. Yeah, I, he, I'm always really impressed whenever uh, whenever that happens because like as far as gaining weight, I'm really good at that part. But like I sort of fuck. It's like you can gain 15 pounds in an hour at a fucking buffet, and it can take me the next three months to to try to lose it back. So I'm really impressed with the way that he goes all out like that for the roles. And he's not the first actor to do so. I mean, I know Christian Bale has famously think of that uh, same thing. famously lost a fuck ton and packed on quite a bit of muscle for various roles, but. Regardless of all that, uh, the... By the way, that's a lie. You can't gain weight by going to a buffet. That food is processed so intently that you poop it out like 15 minutes later. Buffet's like basically no-carb diet. You can eat as much of a buffet as you want, just to tell the fans out there. Right on. Good to know. <laughs> Good dieting tip. That, that's a healthy yeah. lifestyle choice. It's called the Taco Bell lifestyle. There you go. So, the other uh, main star, in, in fact, the, the main character in this movie was actually David Packhouse, played by Miles Teller. Uh, and fun fact, we actually did get to see the real-life David Packhouse in arguably one of the funniest scenes, or at least the, <laughs> the scene that made Richie laugh out loud the most. Uh, the real David Packhouse is actually playing Fear the Reaper on his guitar acoustically at a retirement home, while Miles Teller, as David Packhouse, is trying to sell them really high-quality sheets, essentially, or, or high-quality for an old-person home, not really that high-quality in general, I don't think, but... Didn't he say like 400 thread count on the sheets, which by today's standards isn't that great? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I'm not I'm not a, a bedsheet guy, but I thought on like Parks and Rec they have episodes where they talk like 700, 800 count sheets on the really expensive end. I'm pretty sure rip, uh, rich people wipe their ass with 400 thread count at this point, so I'm I'm not 100. percent I can't verify that. Uh, the really rich po people actually have somebody else wipe their ass ass with the 400 thread count sheets for them, but. That's a whole different thing. David should have tried selling his bed sheets to the rich people that he was massaging then. <laughs> Honestly, that scene kind of bothered I understand. Uh, we're we're going to flash ahead here for a second before we go back and talk about Miles Teller. But So there, Miles Teller is trying to offload all these sheets at one point because that was like a failed business venture before he hooked up with Jonah Hill. And after things take off with Jonah Hill and they're you know going through the good phases – uh, they have like a bonfire scene where they're celebrating and you know just they're they're making bukus of money and they don't even need those fucking boxes of of sheets anymore, which at one point was his like life savings it seemed. Um, why wouldn't you donate those, man? Like I understand like it was fun to have a fire and shit, but give the damn sheets away to like the old people that have shit sheets like that. You know, it's, that was it, just I, uh, to, to get on my usual rant. It was thematic. It was him, like the the whole persona of jonah hill's character in this movie he actually says at one point when his company's name is aey and when someone asks him what it stands for he says we stand for nothing yeah. and like, he, he met the company name and that's literally like the symbol of his character and at that point in the movie uh where they're burning the sheets it's about midway through almost i think it's like a symbol that miles teller teller's character has taken on has chameleoned on to jonah hill's character's life motto basically I it's agree like, it was completely way it was completely, it was just completely wasteful yeah I, it just that, made me think it's like there's it's homeless people on the streets by you right now or you know they don't care whatever. about anything though that, that's, that's true. The yeah way. and that's totally a point and you're right that scene with the uh what does aey stand for even like the first initial response when the, somebody asked that question jonah hill was like you mean morally and it's like <laughs> no like what do the letters stand for uh but yeah but going back a little bit miles teller plays david packhouse who is a young massage therapist who is essentially not really going anywhere uh or at least not anywhere fast he's he feels like he's at a dead end at a young age i believe it mentioned that he dropped out of high or of, uh, for freshman year of college and he just couldn't hold a job and long story short he was massaging old dudes for money and he wasn't really happy with his life then which fuck which fuck you dude because oh my god your girlfriend's smoking hot and cares about you that much like you really got it so tough 
you got a nice little place you're living at with her, and like, oh, I have it so rough. Like, go fuck yourself. I felt the same way, and he's like, I make seventy five dollars an hour massaging. It's like, then fucking book four massages a day and have a great fucking life. <laughs> like, yeah. good lord, that's four. I mean, like, even with travel, you're talking about a six hour work day for six hundred dollars a day. I mean, I'm, I'm that's not you know gonna get you like a gold vault that you can dive into Scrooge McDuck style, but like, it's going to pay the bills pretty easily. I would say, especially if homegirls got something coming in too. She has to have, she, it yeah, seems, I mean, uh... it seems like it. I don't know. That actually is uh, one of my bigger complaints with this movie is that I felt, so first of all, let me say that this movie really gave me vibes in the same sense as the movie blow with Johnny Depp. I and I fucking love that movie for what it's worth. Like I felt like they were very, very comparable. Everything I mean, they had the narration going on, the way they would kind of flash back and forth in time just a little bit. Uh, hell, they even had the Hispanic girlfriend. I mean, in this one she was Cuban, but you know, in that one I I I don't remember what she was, but she she had a accent. Let's just say that. So there was a lot of similarities going on between Blow and uh, War Dogs, even in the sense where for a lot of the movie everything is going fucking great it's like things are riding so well on this wave and every little once in a while there's a hiccup and it just seems that the good times are getting fewer and aren't lasting as long and the hiccups get bigger and bigger throughout the film um yeah, but and it, it goes back to the theme about not having morals and not caring because um you know we all know they become gun runners and do all this shit but if if Jonah Hill's character would have let Miles Teller just do what he was doing and fixing these problems and not getting so involved, everything would have been fine. Everything would have kept going. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're totally right there. There was uh, Miles Teller's character was kind of the moral compass of this movie, if there was one. And <laughs> unfortunately, Jonah Hill, as Richie already pointed out, just having absolutely nothing that they stand nothing that he stands for i mean he's a complete rat he even talks about there's an analogy early on in the film where he explains what they're doing and he talks about all of these government contracts are the pie and the big companies get big pieces of the pie but he's basically like a rat and he calls himself a rat waiting mm -hmm. for the crumbs to fall only when you're dealing with the government the crumbs are worth millions of dollars so that was an analogy that he himself used and it absolutely was fitting throughout this film. But, but that makes it that makes it better that they like they put that in the in the script and the, the writing on this movie compared to some of the ones we've seen lately was a lot better I think. And like he even says like Miles Teller talks about Jonah Hill's character saying when life kicks him he kicks back and he admired him at the beginning of the movie for that when that's the same shit that gets them in trouble and makes him hate him at the end of the movie. Yeah, I, mean, I think it just comes to where the line is, because it, it, you know, like at the the early scene, and it was actually kind of funny. They they hook up, so the two of them hook up at a at a funeral. It sounds weird. They hook up at a funeral. Regard, I mean to say, they re. Wedding pressures. Yeah, there you go. Uh, rule number forty-seven. Anyway, the uh, they reunite at forty-seven or forty-two. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Use both. Follow all the wedding crasher rules. They'll get you places in life. But these two reunite at a funeral uh, for a mutual friend. They had been separated by their parents when they were, like, in 10th grade. It seemed that uh, Jonah Hill's character had a bad influence on Miles Teller's character, and they try to nip it in the bud. But they reconnect, and one of the very first scenes after the funeral, they go to get some weed so they can smoke out together. And the drug dealer isn't home, but there's some guys sitting down by the car in the parking lot, and they're like, hey, you looking for weed? I'm the guy that sells weed to that guy, so you could just buy from me and get it cheaper. Jonah Hill breaks him off three bills, and then the guy's like, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never seen you before, and essentially refuses to give him weed. Well, Jonah Hill just kind of shrugs it off and smiles. is like, all right, it's going to be like that. Well, then he proceeds to the trunk of his car, and he comes out with some sort of automatic assault rifle, and he just kind of Scarface style shoots it up into the air, and these guys go running scared as shit because this guy just brought out a fucking military-grade weapon. That's the point in which Miles Teller kind of has that reflective moment of when people kick him, he kicks back. And then later in the movie, it gets way more extreme than that, and they're dealing with some really dangerous people, and they get into it over really petty amounts of money by comparison. Like, the oh. things... Good? Uh, yeah, that's what I was saying. Like, oh, my God, I was... 
just agreeing with you. I'll yeah, yeah. You. So they're buying some ammunition that they're totally raking a fortune in, and they essentially find out the person they're buying it is doing the exact same. But I'm sorry, the person they're buying it from is doing the exact same thing to them. And whereas Miles Teller is just like, "Fuck it, dude. We're all making money. It's all good. Let's just fucking deal with it and walk out of here rich as fuck." And at the same moment, Jonah Hill is like, "No, we're getting fucked." And like in like either the previous scene or like the very next scene, I can't remember the exact order, but they literally fuck over the people doing all the work for him in the exact same manner. So I yep. mean, like it's it's definitely he's, again the rat metaphor fits through and through. I actually had like a, a, a as the the sub theme for me for this movie was it's this is borrowed from Game of Thrones for all the Game of Thrones Lannister fans out there. It's always pay your debts. That's what this movie the theme that I wrote was like. Um, when we're going to get to Bradley Cooper in a little bit, but Bradley Cooper, who was the scary terrorist watch list guy uh, at the end of the movie, actually pays his debt back. And all the characters that were trying to pay their debts um, actually ended up okay, whereas the people that weren't paying their debts and throwing caution into the wind are the people that were getting fucked over in this movie. Yeah, and Jonah Hill had a pay... He, he loved to get paid, but he had a paying people problem, so it definitely, <laughs> definitely caused some issues. Uh, one thing I wanted to get into, I started to talk about it earlier, and I already said that this movie reminded me a lot of the movie Blow. And especially in the beginning of the movie, when everything was really good. I mean, Blow is in California in the 70s. This was in Miami in the early 2000s. But it had, like, a very, like, we're hanging on the beach, life is good, everything's fun type of vibe in the beginning when they start just doing the small deals. But where it really started to not work as well for me as the movie went on, it became more and more unbalanced, in my opinion, because I feel like this movie was lacking story with Miles Teller and Anna de Armas, who played Izzy, or Iz, I believe it was, his girlfriend slash baby mama. They, I mean, they had a child in this movie, and they completely skipped over the birth of the child. One, one scene, they were getting a sonogram, and then they did a bunch of gun running, and then they came back, and the kid was, like, uh, crying in the middle of the night. And Blow really made you connect to Johnny Depp's character, at, even though he was doing bad things you really, really cared about him because of the way you saw him when things were good, when he was surrounded with his, fr uh, his family and his friends. In that movie, it started when, from his relationship with his parents and then moved on to his relationship uh, with his, I believe she became his wife. But in this movie, they really didn't give a whole lot of screen time to uh, Anna de Armas, and I feel like that hurt the overall connection that you felt with Miles Teller. I feel like if we would have got more scenes with him being a, I, I guess, good boyfriend or, or were they married in the movie? I can't, I don't know. Yeah. He had a ring on his finger. That's the, that's the point I was going to, I was actually going to counter your argument on this is that I actually really liked the way they did all those scenes in this movie. Fair. I think, movie, I think movies like blow spend too much time on that shit. Like you don't go to blow to see stuff like that. I wasn't going to war dogs to see, his relationship with this girl and honestly i felt for her on the scenes where she was mad at him for lying and doing all this other shit i was like damn girl i'm sorry like please forgive me like i felt for it but i think the point of the movie was is that he was in miles teller's character was so involved in this world like even jonah hill at one point says oh it's christmas and i don't even realize yeah they, I, was, they were I, was gonna, so... I was gonna fire the entire office for not showing up <laughs> yeah. they were so involved in the business and what they were doing that everything else became secondary. The fact that he cared about this woman earlier on in the movie, but now he has no problem lying to her left and right now and saying, that's the last lie, that's the last lie. It's It was very telling of, of who he was becoming as a person. And like, I just, I felt like it connected very well. Like a lot of times movies like this do too much about building the backstory. Oh, you had, like they didn't show the birth of the child. It was, they did say something about five months later after she had been pregnant. But it was just like you understood already. Okay, they had the baby. Oh, wow, he's been doing this for that long already? Like, holy crap. It did progress time well. I, I will give you that. You're, you're dead on. But I still would have liked to see a little bit more with their with their relationship personally. But I do I do totally see your point that it it is reflective of their actual mentality at the time being so obsessed with the work that they're doing that everything else just kind of gets squeezed out. So that, that argument I totally dig. I, I would have I would have totally been fine with her getting more screen time because she was absolutely beautiful as well. <laughs> yeah, she she is really hot actually, but yeah, that regard that's not the reason that I would have I would have liked to see more of her for that reason. But I just mean from the character standpoint, I think it would have 
I think it would have made the obsession that Miles Teller and Jonah Hill were going through with their with their getting rich. I think it would have made a bigger impact if we saw the struggle and strain that that was putting on at home because the scene in which she walked out on him and took the baby came completely out of left field. I mean, there I, I didn't really see, think there was any build to that at all. It was just kind of like, well, everything's happy and we're good and I'm kind of lying to you and now I'm kind of lying to you less. And I, I, I just, I don't know. But regardless... So, so you felt the way Miles Teller did when he thought it was coming out of left field too. So it evoked an emotion that they were trying to evoke out of you. Maybe, maybe they did their job perfectly. These two really start getting more and more involved and eventually they get to a point where they've now expanded their company. It went from just being these two scouring this website and trying to fill orders that they could fill to having an entire staff full of people all doing the same thing, trying to find these little crumbs of of, uh, of the big pie of the big pie, and then they discover an opportunity to actually go after the whole fucking pie, as Jonah Hill put it. Uh, that finds us in Vegas, where I assume this is a real thing, just because it sounds like a real thing, but it could very well not be. But they basically have a giant arms convention in las vegas everything has a convention in las vegas so that really wouldn't surprise me and that's that's where miles teller meets bradley cooper's character um whose name they mention his name a few times prior to that but they don't actually show him on screen till probably at least halfway through the movie i would say halfway to two-thirds like i kept thinking damn i thought bradley cooper was in a lot of the previews and i haven't seen him at all yet yeah his name was Henry Gerard, for what it's worth, and they mention him periodically in the earlier parts of the film, talking about how he's essentially he's like a legend of arms dealing and whatnot. Uh, long story short, you find out that he says that he's capable of feeling, filling this giant order that they otherwise would not be able to do just because it would involve working with too many different people all trying to provide the same type of ammo and they'd have to go to like a hundred different vendors to get the amount that was needed. It was like a hundred million rounds of ammo. Bradley Cooper's character said that he could do the entire thing. But there was the little tiny catch that he technically was on the terrorist watch list so he was barred from doing business and they had to kind of work outside of the law. I believe this is one of the scenes where they said that it's not illegal but it seemed pretty illegal. This movie is about following loopholes. Loopholes through loopholes. That's how the whole business was started. It's never a good foundation to start a business on. It's never a good idea to use that to sustain your business. No, that's sustaining is what I was going to say. This is always my thing, man. If like if you or I ever got an opportunity like this, I would be like, "Fuck yeah, let's make some money." Up until the point where it's like, "Hey, you want to make like a half a million dollars for driving through the triangle of death?" Be like, nah, I'm good with this, like, hundred thousand. I'll stick with my crumbs down here that are worth, you know, plenty without having to put my life on the line. But, Screw you. I drove through your mom's triangle of death. <laughs> that was actually a really funny scene. I mean, they're, they're, they made it for a good movie, don't get me wrong, but it's like, it's any movie like this, that's the point in which I start to question it. There's a point in Blow where I felt the same way. It's like, ah, oh, it's the 70s. He's dealing some pot to his neighbors. Fucking live life and have a good time with that shit. Enjoy it. And then that it's was, like... That that was Jonah Hill's character's influence on, on Miles Teller, though. You ever, we've all had those friends. You're basically this friend for me that can <laughs> talk you into doing anything. And when you explain it to other people and you say what they tell you, everyone else is like, why would you still do it? That makes no sense. And like he even <laughs> says in the movie, like he had a way with words. And then when Jonah Hill's character starts talking, Miles Teller actually narrated over what he was saying. Where like You can't actually see what Jonah Hill's saying because Miles Teller is talking about how he just talked him into it. And it's one of, it, I felt like it was one of those things where it's like, some people just have that way against, uh, against other people. I'm not calling you a shitty friend, although you can't. I would hope not, man. <laughs> You've talked me into a lot of shitty things in my life. but like, uh, what, they, what have I talked you into that's so bad? Let's, let's, all, air, they, let's air they this all, out. Let's air this out on the internet. For they all, all make good stories. They all make good <laughs> stories. Are you piling up mattresses outside of our apartment so you can jump off the balcony? I was the one that jumped. You didn't have to jump. I know, except we didn't put enough mattresses out there. We almost watched you break your neck. <laughs> Almost. It was the it, perfect amount because I didn't break my neck. He almost miss, missed the mattresses, and then instead of <laughs> stopping, he decides, we'll just combine the mattresses to make it a smaller area of, of effect, but stack it up higher. Which, to be fair, you did make the second jump, but I will tell the viewers this. I have never seen so much fear in a man's eyes <laughs> as when you bounced off the top mattress, and I saw all the fear in your eyes where you thought you might land on your head. Oh, dude, yeah. The, and okay, I laughed so my ass off. 
I remember that very well. I mean, that was a fun day for me. I jumped off of a fucking balcony onto a pile of mattresses at our old apartment complex. It was great. But uh, In a Speedo. <laughs> yeah, well, that's how we met our neighbors, too. <laughs> but regardless of all that, the part that was scary as fuck is I got a lot more bounce back than I initially thought that I would. You know, I, I thought that I was going to bounce up a little bit. But no, dude, like it felt like I bounced a good like ten feet back up into the air and like I had to look up in the air at you after you hit. <laughs> yeah, and, and it like the way I landed, I tried to flat back it. Like for you wrestling fans, I use my extensive knowledge of watching wrestling for years to be like, All right, land on as much of my body as possible. That'll work. Well, the problem with that is I hit on my back. Is that wrestling's and, fake? Well, there's that. But uh, <laughs> but I hit on my back, and it caused me to do, like, a backflip. And, yeah, it was terrifying, but it was it was super fun. And, again, well, that's not a story that caused you any sort of I, – I didn't put your life in danger. Every time we drive to the movies or drive anywhere, our only rule is we can't die. And that's a pretty dangerous rule as well. <laughs> Dude, uh, Emily, I had to get somewhere really fast for Emily the other day, and she's like, I give you permission to drive like you do on Grand Theft Auto, and I was just like, holy shit, we're going to die today. That's like getting a hall pass. <laughs> it was amazing. It really was. And then I was like, I was like, you did really well. Like, I'm, I'm impressed. You didn't, like, scream or anything the entire time. And she's like, I didn't open my fucking eyes. <laughs> like, well, we're here on time, so you're welcome. But, yeah, I anyway. Just cause she, I think it's because she physically couldn't open her eyes because you were driving so fast, the whiplash was just... You know, it's like in Toy Story towards the end when they're flying on the rocket and Woody's eyes are going, Bloo. you probably haven't seen Toy Story. I have. I love Toy Story. Okay, good man, good man. I was gonna say, I, I, uh, I'll be honest, I think the second one is really overrated, but the oh, rest absolutely. of them are great. I, I absolutely. don't understand why they have so much love for the second one, but the first and the third are fantastic. I but regardless, let's talk about War I'll Dog talk. some more. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's just gonna happen. Let's talk about. We were talking about, about uh, Bradley Cooper. Yeah, I, yeah, we were talking about Bradley Cooper, and again, uh, he shows up pretty late in the film. But I am always really impressed with Bradley Cooper. He's uh, every time he's in a very much like Jonah Hill recently. But every time I see Bradley Cooper, it really doesn't matter what he's doing. I like him. Uh, there was a line in particular all the way at the end of the movie but they they spoil it in the previews that i really 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 dig and i think kind of fits into the theme of this movie a lot as well it essentially says or bradley cooper essentially tells miles teller over some 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 beef between them that had occurred earlier in the film uh, that he's not a bad man but sometimes he's in a position where he has to ask himself what a bad man would do and i thought that was really an interesting line i thought that really uh fit well into a lot of the character choices that happen in this film uh, bradley cooper was another role in this movie where i was like dang i i, I combined dang and damn when i just said that i was like dang I was, dang i was wondering what that word was but, cool. <laughs> but i was like man dang. <laughs> he was really good in this movie he had a he had a minor well not a minor role a side role in this but uh, I was worried when I saw it was a Todd Phillips movie. I was like, oh, it's a hangover guy bringing in hangover buddies into the movie. But Bradley Cooper was really good in this. Like, he kind of creeps you out of parts, and you're like, okay, what's this guy going to do? Like, I don't trust this guy, but it's the only choice you have, so you kind of have to go with it. And, like, especially the glasses he was wearing. The glasses sold me They're on this great, character. Dude. They yeah. just made him look like a, a, pedo a guy wearing a pedophile's glasses from the 70s, but it's Bradley Cooper. You had just mentioned it earlier when you're talking about Bradley Cooper working with the Hangover director and being brought in as one of the, the usual crew. That's something I wanted to talk about in this uh, film, that there was some humor in this movie. There was a few parts that really you know made you chuckle. A lot of it, honestly, was just laughing at Jonah Hill's laugh in this, frankly. <laughs> but uh, that's something that I wanted to really stress across, is this was not a Hangover-style movie at all. No, it wasn't. The, the, the humor in this, the, the, the parts that... Jonah Hill made you laugh. The parts that Miles Teller made you laugh. It it wasn't like they were doing their usual stick. It was it was yeah. really really well done humor, and it fit. It didn't take away from the very serious and fairly actiony plot that was happening. It wasn't like a traditional action. There wasn't like a ton of gunfights for a gun running movie, frankly. But it was a a lot of events that were happening that kept you on the edge of your seat, regardless. Yeah, I was pleasantly surprised. This movie took a much more serious approach than I expected it to. I expected it to be somewhat serious, but I expected to have that sort of hangover feeling to it because it's Todd Phillips, but it wasn't at all. And I was actually really happy with him doing this kind of approach to this movie. And uh, it's just, uh, he made me forget that I was watching a movie directed by the guy that directed all three hangovers, which is 
kind of the highest compliment compliment you can give somebody in this situation. Yeah, definitely. I mean, going back to our first review that we did talking about uh, Ghostbusters with Paul Feig it, or Feig, did we ever figure out how to say his name? I forgot. Yeah, I think it's Paul Feig. But regardless, uh, that unfortunately, again, I'm not trying to be like on the Ghostbusters bashing train. I think I actually gave it a pretty pretty solid review, at least a six and a half or something like that. But regardless of all that, a uh, there was parts of that that felt like bridesmaids with plasma guns instead of like a Ghostbusters film. But this movie did not have that effect at all. Yeah, it's supposed to be a gun running movie about people scamming the government and scamming everybody and it was a gun running movie about people scamming the government and scamming everybody exactly exactly let's see was there anything else on this that or any one any of the other casts that you wanted to uh, call out and, and mention that caught your eye uh we talked about the, the big four for me the two leads bradley cooper and then uh what's her face anna de, anna de armis hold me in my armis <laughs> Uh, the only other one that I will I would like to mention uh, somebody that I like almost every time I see him is uh, Kevin Pollock. He's a very small role in this, but he he holds his own in the scenes that he's in. I like the guy, especially a scene towards the end. Spoiler alert on this one, pretty big. Uh, I'll give you a second just in case. He wears a wire at one point to bust that ends up causing these guys to get busted. And uh, that scene in particular, after you go, after they flash back and show him, it's like, oh wow, yeah, that totally did make sense that he was. I didn't, I didn't see that coming. Maybe I'm just an idiot. Maybe you totally saw that coming. Um, I thought that he was probably going to try to screw Miles Teller over in some way, shape, or form. I didn't realize that the feds had gotten to him. Well, I mean, the the guy in Albania said, if you don't pay the money, I know what you guys did. Yeah, um, yeah, and then the fucker still didn't pay. That was the insane part. And I think yeah. that Miles Teller legitimately, he had said, the first thing I'm going to do when I get back is make sure you get your money transferred to you. But really what happened is the first thing that he did is he tried to tell Jonah Hill he's done, and it caused a huge fight, and I guess things just kind of slipped by the wayside. Oh, he had no intention. Miles Teller didn't have any intention of paying him money either. On the plane ride back, the narration um said i never want to go i never went back to albany again and he told the guy numerous times i'll be back in a week and the first thing i'm gonna do is get your money and like you could tell by the way he was talking on the narration on the plane back he had no intention they were in over their heads I, see, thought I, had... I thought that he definitely i thought that he was still gonna wire the money i knew that he wasn't gonna go back to albania but i got the impression that he was like it's ridiculous that you haven't been paid i'll make sure this gets taken care of i thought that that was one of the many things that jonah hill just basically kept from him so that you know it wasn't really happening the way that he was told it was i believe miles teller when he said um you haven't been paid and like the the remorse he sees where he realizes they haven't been paid but once things start festering very quickly in in that same scene he's just like i gotta get the hell out of here and i i think that whole aspect and that that's what it was he is turning into jonah hill in some regards where it's like i gotta look out for number one let's get the fuck out of here i gotta get home and I, I, I don't think he had any intent. He, I think it just left his mind after that. I mean, this dude that was friendly to him and driving around everywhere is missing. Um, and he's so concerned when he's looking at the wife. But then he doesn't mention him again until the very end of the movie after he's realized he's not like Jonah Hill and he stops being like Jonah Hill. That's when he brings up the missing guy again. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, again, everything always feels thematic to me. I try to, I try to look you at do. it. You do, yeah. I, I still stand by the fact. I think on this particular instance, that that was just an, a a deal between Miles Teller thinking that his friend was one way and not really connecting it all the way. Which that was something actually. There is a scene at the very beginning where Jonah Hill basically tells Miles Teller that his uncle screwed him out of seventy thousand, uh, and then you find out later that the uncle is saying that Jonah Hill screwed him out of seventy thousand. I don't stole think they, 70, yeah, I don't think they actually ever clarify what really happened there, but I think based on what we learn about Jonah Hill, it's pretty easy to assume that he probably did the screwing over. Well, and if you can't have the actual person put their input into the movie, then that's what you're going to be made to look like you did. And again, silence speaks volumes in these cases. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You can tell why David Packhouse, the real-life David Packhouse, would be a lot more... Uh, open to getting involved with this project for sure. Yeah. yeah, it made him look like he was coaxed into doing this, and 
and uh, it, it wasn't against his will, but like he kind of got mind fucked into doing it, and then he couldn't back out, and then things got real serious. But he wanted the money, so he let things go when he shouldn't have. I mean, a normal person, as soon as I, I would have never even wanted to do the job. When I found out you're an when I know you're an arms dealer, I don't care how much money you're making. Like, holy crap, I don't I don't want money that bad. I'm good with it as long as I don't have to put my life in danger. But you know, whatever. <laughs> but uh, we we were talking about. Uh, themes and, and things coming full circle um what i want to i, I kind of hinted at this when we got done watching the movie um spoiler alert we're going to spoil the last scene of the movie here yeah that's uh, all we have left to talk about is the end yeah yeah bradley cooper or well miles teller goes back to being a massager whatever massage massage therapist and when he opens the door for his client it's bradley cooper standing there uh bradley cooper earlier had basically threatened to kill him um because Jonah Hill screwed Bradley Cooper over, and Bradley Cooper thought they were both together always, so he kidnapped the first one and the closest one to him, which was Miles Teller, and put a gun in his face, beat the shit out of him, and threatened to kill him. Um, but that's all said and done, and he wants to make peace with Miles Teller when he realizes uh, that maybe he went a little overboard and it, it's, it wasn't Miles Teller's fault, and basically offers him a big pile of money because Miles Teller never indicted Bradley Cooper's character at all, never mentioned him at all. Miles Teller said he didn't think it was worth mentioning. But more so, you know he did it because Miles Teller was a smart guy at the end of this movie and knew how to save his own skin. Um, but Bradley Cooper presents him basically not with hush money, but like a thank you for being loyal to me in a fucked up way money. Um, and, and he doesn't want him to ever ask any more questions of Bradley Cooper. And this is basically their last meeting. And the camera pans out with Miles Teller and Bradley Cooper looking at, at this suitcase full of money. And you don't actually see if he takes it or not. Um, and I asked Miles at the end of this movie, I said, do you think he took it? Uh, it was one of those inception with the spin. I, I was going to say, I responded by scene. saying, I don't know, did the top fall at the end? So, yeah, we were very, very much an inception style of ending, which, frankly, I'm not a huge fan of. I, I always want closure in these situations, but I understand. It, it stopped moving for. in inception. I'm, I'm sorry to spoil this for everybody, but it stopped moving. I don't care what. Uh... <laughs> That's such a huge Internet <laughs> debate, dude. Like that is like basically <laughs> declaring that Bush did 9-11. Like you're going to get like everybody going nuts about like, no, it didn't. Blah, blah, blah. It's still like one of the most. It, it wobbled. On IMDb. It wobbled, which means there was something flawed on the table or something flawed in the spinning. Fair enough. Again, I, I honestly don't even know, but uh, I, I just know that like if you get on IMDb and that message board, that is still one of just like the most insanely like vile, like people are still so passionately arguing for and against that case. That's Christopher Nolan for you, man. That's one of the reasons I like him. Yeah, I agree. I, I like him a lot too. Um, except, so, except for The Dark Knight Rises, but you know that is what it is. So, did he take the money? I would assume, yeah. I don't think he did. <laughs> I guess we'll never know. <laughs> I don't think. Well, I, I was letting you bring up your your points here. I, uh, well, uh, here I'll, I'll, the reason I think yeah is because he was so adamantly fighting at the end. I mean, all he wanted when he was trying to get out is he wanted his cut, and he even like mathematically broke it down to the percentage of work that he did, so that he wasn't asking for all of his cut. And then he was like, "I'll even take forty cents on the dollar of what that portion is." So like he was just trying to get one last payday, and I feel like that. Yeah, he's gonna take that money and he's gonna live happily ever la uh, happily ever after until a movie studio comes around knocking on the door asking if they can use his life story for a film. But there you go. He needed money, so he did a movie, which means he didn't take the money. Oh, or I was gonna just, get. I was gonna spend get, it all. I was gonna get thematic about it and just. Of course say, you like, were. That's your thing, man. Yeah. Well, I mean, he broke away from that world completely. He decided. He realized that he was perfectly fine being. He even says, "I'll go back." To being a massage therapist he was fine going back to the way things were and this is before he, he was still living in that dope ass apartment at the end yep yeah which you could sell or rent out and get money for that so i think from from his character standpoint after he gets rid of jonah hill he has no need for that anymore i, I feel would like say it, that no matter who you are you can always use the money frankly it's a but... movie it's not real life like it's supposed to make it's sense based on real life yeah based not factual fair enough you know, we uh, we are. That's the actual ending of the film, and I like the last line is basically Miles Teller's asking all these questions, and and Bradley Cooper says literally no more questions as he hands him the money. Um, but there was actually one other really really important scene, though. At the same time, you knew this was coming. You knew the big fight between them was coming the entire time, and it, it kind of escalated in the office scene earlier we talked about. But this movie was really sad in a lot of ways, just in the. For a, for a lot of the film, because you totally could see that 
the relationship between the two best friends, who Miles Teller, I think, at least absolutely believed they were really best friends, at least in the beginning, um, and didn't really realize that he was being played just like everyone else until the end. But, and again, that, that to me felt really, really dark and sad. Like, I didn't like the way I felt thinking about their friendship. It, you know, it hurt my feelings. But there was a scene in the uh, in the elevator oh. right before they get busted in which essentially Jonah Hill is trying to play Miles Teller again. And you kind of think, oh, my God, they're going to, you know, make amends and everything. And then Miles Teller is just like, no, man, I can tell you're fucking acting. You're not being sincere with me. You're just saying what I want to hear because you know that I could fuck us over if you, you know, if I talk to the newspaper or whatever. I and actually think that was my favorite moment in the whole movie. It was I, I do too, even though it was a sad moment. It was a it was really short. strong moment. Well, you actually could, you actually believe Jonah Hill when he's acting remorseful and talking to him. Like he actually did a good job of of being like, "Man, I'm so sorry I fucked up." And and then Miles Teller says, no, you're just playing the part of of my best friend. Like you're not actually my best friend. And like it's finally Miles Teller gets it after all this time because he hasn't gotten it through the entire movie. And uh, you know, I, I call life. I called. I said something earlier in the the podcast about Miles Teller trying to chameleon into Jonah Hill, but really Jonah Hill through the whole movie was a chameleon. And they talk about it repeatedly about how he when he's talking to somebody on the phone or trying to sell somebody something, he becomes who they think he should be. And he plays that up to get what he wants from people. Yeah, and it's like Miles really Teller knew it from the get go. Like, there's parts where, like, the, their business partner he pretends to be Jewish because their business, like, their financier is Jewish, so he's able to convince them that they're they're trying to protect Israel. And then at one point they're talking to like a army general and he's about to get everything fucked for him. So he's like, from one Christian to another, let me please <laughs> pray on your heart and blah, 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 and all this good stuff. So yeah, he's absolutely a douchebag, chameleon type of person. Uh, and Chameleon rat. Yeah, chameleon rat. But uh, I, I think in this case, he's definitely a little bit exaggerated for the sake... I don't know the person in real life, but I would say the characteristics of this are exaggerated for the sake of a good movie. But yeah. at the same time, I think everybody's met those people where I, well hell if you've ever bought a car you've probably met somebody who's tried to you know be your best friend and you know oh hey we're good but i'm i'm into what you're into or whatever it's you can't even necessarily blame sales people sometimes just because of the pressure they're under they got to do what they got to do to to get their numbers but at the same time it's super insincere and super douchey yep couldn't put it better myself <laughs> <laughs> I think it's time for us to uh, to get to our reviews here. Is it so moment of truth time? So All right. So give us what you got. Show us what you've got. Nice. More Rick and Morty for you, folks. So going into this movie, I had pretty good expectations. I uh, I I thought that it was actually going to be a little bit more comedy and a little bit less of their story, but I was pleasantly surprised that it was not. Um, again, I think that it was very similar to Blow, which is a movie that I absolutely love, but the longer the movie went on, the less well it did at being blow. Or not, not that it was trying to be blow, but it just felt like it. It felt like it's at points that it was really using that model and just not using it as successfully. So at the end of the day, I'm giving this a very, very watchable 6.5 out of 10. Guns large enough to compensate for something. Wow, I feel like. Uh... Are you trying to make up for some of these high reviews in the past here? That's a pretty low one for you. I was between the 6.5 and the 7, and I did for the first time since I've been reviewing. I bounced to the lower one instead of the higher one. And for once, I we had the same ballpark at the beginning, and I went from a 6.5 to a 7, actually. That's hilarious. Wow. Yeah. it's uh, I was expecting it to be a comedy more so, and I like the dark approach they took. I like how they explained how the business worked and like this is stuff that actually happened. Dick Cheney's America, so to say. Dick Cheney's America was uh, fun, yeah. And I thought it was it, like it actually shed a little bit of light on how stuff like this works and kind of makes you question things the government does or how they get certain things a little bit. Um, but I, they kind of, oh, go like, ahead, uh, sorry. So they kind of, I guess the government in ways for this based on a true story account did their due diligence in researching some of the things. But it makes you wonder like, what, they probably don't care where they get a lot of this shit from in most cases. Like, money, why would they? Dude, money is everything in the world, and that's. And wow. They even talk about it at the beginning. I mean, this is, we're gonna. I'm gonna get semi-political here, but if 
you think that war is about anything other than making money, you are wrong. I mean, that is really the, the reason that we are in perpetual war is because people get fucking rich off of that shit and they want to keep that happening. So, that, you know, that's just my opinion. You know, I don't speak for Richie and I don't speak for everyone, but that that really did shed light on this. And when you look at it, they even admitted that this was kind of a, um example of how stupidly loose they got with their rules on on financing war or not financing wars but supplying everything everything for war but yeah i I do want to say that as far as the lower rating goes oh if i didn't clarify i I don't remember if i said it but i I gave this 7.5 or 7.0 million ammo capacity clips whatever ak-47 rounds out of 10 there you go (laughs) (laughs) hopefully you didn't give it a 7 out of 100 million but Regardless, uh, I, I really like the story. I really like the acting, hardcore. The uh, the thing that, that just slipped a little for me is I felt the pacing on this was a little bit off, which apparently spoke to you. I thought that the pacing could have been a little bit better. I thought that we could have... I, I, I feel that we missed out on who uh, David Packhouse was as, outside of just being a gun runner. But let's, let's just speak on... Uh... You from last week. You just want to see the sausage and the bun get together. That's all you can see. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. So, anyway, it is time for our weekly recommendations, where we try to shed some light on something that you may or may not have seen in the past, and uh, and somebody something connected with the movie that we just saw. And I'm gonna, as usual, let the whiz kid go first. Who do you want to recommend, or what would you like to recommend this week, Richie? Well, we already talked about it a lot, but uh, I'm definitely I I had to go Moneyball, man. I, it's and a lot of people did see it, but at the same time, I feel like a lot of them are just baseball fans in general. Because uh, outside of you and your wife, a lot of people I talk to never watch Moneyball, and that's Jonah Hill's a connection. And it's basically about reinventing the way you put a team together in baseball. Um, and it stars Brad Pitt, and it's it's about the Oakland Athletics from the early 2000s. Um, and honestly, I hate Oakland because I'm a Texas Ranger fan, but I still love this movie. I absolutely love the movie. And Jonah Hill is actually has my favorite scene in the movie, which is towards the end where he shows that footage of the fat baseball player hitting a home run, but the guy doesn't realize he hit a home run and he trips rounding first base because he's trying to stretch a single and do a double. And he tells Brad Pitt it's a metaphor because Brad Pitt's character came up with something that was a home run, but he didn't realize it right away. And I, I love it because he looks at Brad Pitt and goes, it's a metaphor, and Brad Pitt just laughs at him and goes, I know. <laughs> Yeah. That is that's a really I know exactly what scene you're talking about and that's a really good scene as gets well, me every time gets me as every well time. as a really good movie in general I do highly recommend Moneyball as well if you haven't seen it and Jonah Hill is quick Oscar becoming, nominated in that is he, oh yeah he was and he's quickly becoming one of my favorite movies that makes me even think more so that that if since he was Oscar nominated for that that makes me uh, back to the top of the show that makes me even think more so that he uh, probably the guy he played probably was opposed to it or something just the, the the way that quote came off it made me wonder something had to have been there. But regardless, I'm going to go a different direction. I was going to recommend something with Miles Teller, but I decided to save that for now because I, well, frankly, didn't realize it was her at first. I had to use IMDb to figure it out. But Anna de Armas, who plays Iz in this movie, hasn't been in a whole lot. However, she was in one of my absolute favorite movies uh, that came out, in tw- uh, came out last year in 2015 as a happily married man i can honestly say this might be the most terrifying movie i've ever seen in my entire life and i am a horror movie buff so i I see pretty much everything that's considered scary and and it's not the most fucked up but it's a super fucked up film it's a it's by eli roth who does a lot of really dark shit and twisted shit in general this movie is called knock knock starring keanu reeves it also has eli roth's uh, girlfriend lorenza izzo as well as anna de armas um Without giving too much away, Keanu Reeves is a happily married man with children. He's has, I think he's an architect, and he's working on a project where he, he's not able to attend some sort of vacation or event with his wife and kids, so he's left at the house alone. It's a dark and rainy night, and while he's working, there's a knock-knock at the door, hence the title of the film. Uh, it turns out that it is Lorenza Izzo and Anna de Armas, who are the are two girls that are scantily clad and soaking re- wet in the rain, and it's kind of a new twist on the old "Can I use your phone because of the storm" thing. In this case, because it is a modern day film, they say, "Oh my God, we are on this way to this party. It started storming on us. Our phones got wet, and they no longer work." 
can we please use your phone to call an Uber? Uh, he, being a nice guy, of course, invites them into the house where he allows them to use the fo phone, and then some crazy shit happens. And, uh, Richie, you'd like this one, because if nothing else, you get to see her naked. So, there's an added bonus for you. Good for her. <laughs> but yeah, so definitely check out Knock Knock if you're a horror fan, but uh, it's it's more of a thriller in this case than a traditional horror, but again, it's, uh, it's a pretty twisted film. I highly recommend it. Well, speaking of horror, I think next week we're going to go see uh, Don't Breathe, right? Hell yeah, and I'm very, very excited. This one, uh, I saw my first preview for this one just about a month and a half ago or so, and ever since I've been really, uh, really stoked to go to this one. The only uh, thing I don't like is the the trailer on that's playing on TV nonstop now says like where well, you can't see all your other senses work better and I'm like that's actually a myth, but that's okay. Well, I can let that slide. I didn't know that for what it's worth. I haven't actually seen that. I've only seen the theatrical trailer when we go to the movies each week, so I haven't seen any of the TV spots for it. But that's interesting. Uh, so anyway, you've already talked about our upcoming movie review that'll be coming up this next Friday. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to plug this week, Richie? On Twitter, I'm at the Wiz underscore kid 23, and also uh, you might want to cover your ears. Oh wait, they already are. Um, since you always talk about this wrestling thing you love so much, Dallas Cowboys pregame season two tonight or week two tonight. So I hope you're excited. That's going to be starting here in about four hours. Well, as usual, I am at Mr. Most Days Off. You can find me on Twitter, obviously YouTube, pretty much everywhere else. Uh, Richie already brought up wrestling, so I'll go ahead and talk about my weekly review of the WWE Cruiserweight Classic that comes out each and every Wednesday night, where I just share my thoughts on the current tournament that's going on. We're going to be finishing up round two this week, so it should have some pretty good matches, and we're starting to get into the meat of this thing, so if you're a wrestling fan, please come and check that out. Other than that, we look forward to Don't Breathe next week, and we will see you then.